Good evening and welcome to Meet the Candidates Night for Penfield Central School District. I'm School District Clerk Sharon Erkmitz and I'm on behalf of the district, I'm happy to announce that we have five candidates running this year for three open seats on the Board of Education. I'd like to thank all our candidates for being here tonight um, so that the community can um, hear their views and special thanks also to our partners at PCTV, Dave and um, Brian and especially to our executive director of Monroe County School Boards, Sherry Johnson, for once again, serving as our amazing monitor. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sherry and we can start the evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Penfield Meet the Candidate Night. Before we ask the candidates to give their opening remarks, I would like to speak to the work of elected board trustees. As said in the title, Board of Education members hold the public trust. While they are locally elected officials, those in our suburban districts are nonpartisan and unpaid. Board members need to devote hundreds of hours during their term to learn about their roles and responsibilities. On top of the 12 legislated hours of professional development Board of Education members are required to complete within their first term, members must also become familiar with education law, school finance law, state education department regulations, and the ever-changing impact that federal and state mandates have on their school districts. And they must also make sure that they are available to their community by serving on district committees, attending and participating in district functions and events. So I want to thank each of these candidates for making a commitment to pursuing this important avenue of service to students and the greater Penfield community. With that said, let's learn more about those who would like to serve in that role. In ballot order, we have Grant Kirk, Emily Belser, Dana Marr, Nicole Doily, and Krista Kahn. Candidates, you will be given two minutes to provide an opening statement, and after questions, a two minute closing statement. After your opening remarks, I will use the ballot order to begin the questions but I will then rotate the next question and each question after an order so that each of you can be the first to answer a question. As Sharon indicated, you will be given two minutes to answer each question and please watch the card Sharon is holding. Yellow is 30 seconds and red means stop. I also want to thank Sharon Herkfitz, the Penfield PTSA and the Penfield District Technology team for setting up tonight's event and asking me to be a part. There are more questions submitted by the community than we have time for this evening. So I have combined similar questions or have reworded parts of a question in an effort to cover all of the topics candidates have been asked to address. So let's get started with opening statements and we will be starting with Grant. And go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you, Sherry. Good evening. I'm not going to sit up here tonight and pretend to be someone I'm not. Besides seven years in Austin, Texas after college, I've lived in Penfield my entire life. I moved back to Penfield in 2012 to raise my family. I'm a run of the mill middle class dad. I work hard and the majority of my time is spent doing the mundane things that come with raising a family. Don't get me wrong, I'm very grateful for the many blessings in my life. I appreciate everyone taking the time tonight to hear what I and the rest of the candidates have to say. It takes a lot of courage in the world we live in to get up here and do what we're doing. There's going to be differing opinions as to what we feel is best for the students of this district. So please be respectful to all the candidates as we go through this election process. So why am I doing this? I'm a concerned father of four young children. As their dad, I have a responsibility to look out for their best interests. As a potential future board member, we have a responsibility to do what's in the best interest of every student in the Penfield community. What we do here matters. The decisions we make are important. The decisions we make now impact the future success of these kids' lives. I'd like to be very clear about two things. I have no agenda, and I am not endorsed by any outside groups or influences. That said, this board needs balance. Over the past two years, I've been regularly attending board meetings. I have yet to see one board member vote different than the other. It's either all yes or all no. I question how much diversity of thought is on the board today. A successful board must have differing views and opinions in order to be successful in representing the community's interests as a whole. While out this past week, I have heard several repeated concerns about changes to curriculum 
that could impact our longstanding history of academic excellence. For example, eliminating honors classes and the changes to the music program. The lack of transparency regarding these changes is a concern. Why was there no community involvement? I would like to see more community involvement in these and future decisions. These are just a few examples of what is on my radar over the next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Emily, you get next two minutes for your opening statement. Okay. Thank you, Sharon, for all you do. And thank you, Sherry, for moderating tonight, as well as all of your service to Monroe County. And thank you to all the viewers attending this event to learn more about each candidate running for the school board. My name is Emily Belser, and I'm running for re-election because I strongly believe in doing what's best for our kids, all kids. My children and I have lived in Penfield for the past seven years, and I'm grateful for their public school experience. Having children at the elementary, middle, and high school levels has provided me the opportunity to make connections with faculty, staff, and other families and community members, allowing me the insight into the accomplishments as well as the challenges within our school community. I've been a member of the board for the past three years and have spent time listening, asking questions, and in turn, advocating for our children at the county and state levels. I'm committed to working collaboratively with the district to meet the needs of all of our students. The pandemic has shed light on the social emotional needs of our students. I believe it is important to listen to them, to listen to their experiences, and to make sure that all students feel, feel heard, supported, and included in our schools. All of our work is guided by the district goals, which, which are academic achievement and excellence, partnerships, and fiscal responsibility. I look forward to continuing my work on the board, bringing my experience and perspective, and ask for your vote on May 17th. Thank you. Thank you. And Dana, your opening remarks. Good evening. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, who helped uh, coordinate tonight's uh, to this evening's event um, for Meet the Candidates. I am Dana Marr. I'm seeking a seat on the Penfield School Board. Uh, my priority, first and foremost, is to support the children, um, the students, and also support the administration and the staff in having the tools and resources nece necessary to effectively do that. I stand on a few key points. My first being prioritizing academics. My second being shining light on the mental health crisis. And my third point being giving the community a voice. With the current focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, it is vital that every child is recognized as unique and valuable, with no child or group being more or less important than another, with one of the main roles of the board being to provide a set of checks and balances in the running of the school district. I also recognize uh, the importance of diversity and thought and perspective among board members. When you have a set of board members with different perspectives coming together in the process of reviewing decisions to be made in the oversight of the district, it allows for more robust discussion and opportunity to support transparency and gain improved trust among school employees, students, and the general community as a whole regarding the management of district issues. With over 20 years of experience working in the field of human services, I bring forward a wealth of knowledge on various community resources and supports for a wide range of needs. I additionally bring over a decade of solid leadership, uh, experience, creativity, and passion uh, to support our kids knowing they are our future generation. As a parent, I've had my eyes open to many challenges kids are facing um, in the educational environment, and it's vital we do the very best we can to ensure we are equipping our kids with the necessary tools and resources to be successful. Um, we can only do that by supporting our kids in the dark district um, and being able to effectively educate and support our students. Um, I'm stepping forward in effort of making a positive impact in the district as well as in our community. Thank you. Thank you. And Nicole, you're open your mind. Thank you so much. First, I just want to thank the, the sitting school board and administrators and faculty and staff for all that you do. We know that Penfield School District is one of the best in Rochester, and that's largely because of you. Uh, not too long ago, we parents received that foreboding email saying, schools will be shut for a short time while this you know, little pandemic blows over. And we all know that it was much longer than a short time, and it wasn't a little pandemic. but. But our kids learned anyway, and they grew academically and, and learned crucial life skills, and, and I'm very grateful for that. 
I am the parent of two kids in Penfield. Um, I'm a podcast host, an author, an educator, and a speaker. And I'm running for the school board because as great as Penfield schools are, I believe we can be better. And I believe that some of my skills will help push us forward. I am a moderate who can look at multiple sides of an issue and articulate differences and suggest a reasonable path forward. I ask great questions, and some would say I ask too many questions, <laughs> but I can distill out the important stuff and articulate a cogent conclusion. I'm a realist and I like action. I struggle with stagnation and I will do my best to keep Penfield from stagnating. I want our kids to have a quality education and a quality education includes so many things, but it also includes learning how to consider and examine diverse voices, learning how to think critically and growing into wise, empathetic leaders. And I'd love to have your vote on the 17th. Thank you. And Krista, your opening statement, please. Thank you, Sherry. Good evening, everyone. My name is Krista Kahn, and I am seeking your support as a candidate for the Penf Penfield Central School Board of Education. I am originally from Trinidad and Tobago and have been living here in Penfield with my family for 18 years. I have three children in the school district, two high schoolers, and one elementary student. My education journey started as a Montessori teacher in Trinidad and a private tutor where I taught for approximately 10 years. I am seeking a seat on the board because I hold certain principles. Education needs to be equitable for all students, regardless of their background. Students in this district need to have access to the various benefits and programs that Penfield prides itself on. Taxpayers and members of this community need to see fiscal responsibility and that the district is allocating funds to programs that have the most benefit for all of our students. And lastly, the role of the board is to work closely and respectfully with the superintendent and administrators to create ethical policies that support the district in succeeding with their goals. I believe with my background and varied lived experiences, I can bring new perspective to some of the issues facing the district right now. Thank you for your time and for the opportunity to be here this evening. Thank you, everyone. We are going to go back to the ballot order from the beginning for the very first question. And the very first question I had from the community you have all answered in your opening statements. So I'm just going to move on to the next one, which is also a board question. And it is, how will you handle disagreement with fellow board members, the superintendent, or community members. And again, we'll start at the top. So Grant, you get this question first for two minutes. I'm sorry, Sherry, can you repeat that? Absolutely. How will you handle disagreements with fellow board members, the superintendent, or community members? Well, living in a house with six people, there's plenty of disagreement <clears throat> that goes around. So, um, you know, just like anything, you know, common sense, um, I have a great deal of respect for everybody and everyone's opinions. Um, I think it's important for a diverse board to have disagreements and to, you know, debate those issues and come up with the best, most common sense resolution to the things that, uh, you know, that we're discussing and what we're trying to put forth. So um, I, I don't see myself that being, uh, you know, a hard thing to do by any means. Um, I just think it's part of the, the responsibility of the board to work together. And just like anything in life, there's gonna be a disagreements and uh, keeping it respectful and uh, respecting everyone's opinions will, uh, I think will be good. Thank you. Emily, you get this question. Do you need me to repeat it? Um, yes, please. How will you handle disagreements with fellow board members, the superintendent or community members? Sure. Um, so the role of a board member is to listen, listen to other members of the board, listen to community members, listen to the advice of the superintendent and work together to come to a resolution. 
Um, many times within our board, um, we have disagreements. Um, we What we do is we ask clarifying questions. Um, and then we come to a consensus. What many people see is in a board meeting, we all seem like we agree. Um, but that can be further. That can't be further from the truth. We spend time um, asking clarifying questions to make sure that we are able to come to our own um, our own decisions that we can make. Um, we can vote our conscious. And um, we really just work together. We work through any of our issues, um, whether it be during a board meeting or whether it be um, in our executive sessions. Um, but our job is to work together to make sure that um, we look out for the best interest of the students. And if we keep that in mind, um, we usually come to some type of consensus what for the best interest, excuse me, of the children. Thank you. Dana, same question. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, so in terms of disagreements, um, whether it be with the board, whether it be with the superintendent, um, you know, whether it be um, with whomever, it's really important to open and engage in good discussion, um, you know, understanding the points of um, the others that you're speaking with, um, really listening for understanding um, and, and talking through those, um, you know, sharing information, um, you know, and, and, and really connecting in, um, talking through the different things. If there's not disagreement, I feel like sometimes um, we might miss really important things that we need to look at um, and, and gain further understanding of as we're looking at important decisions to be made. Um, that can be where some of the best work is done is really understanding one another and being able to um, you know, engage in those conversations um, and, and sometimes disagreements that are um, can be uncomfortable, but we work together and uh, really at the end of the day uh, come to um, hopefully some really great solutions in that process. So um, yeah, I, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, same <clears throat> um, So I think First of all, it depends where that disagreement happened. If it happened sort of publicly in a meeting in front of everybody, then I think it, it has to be dealt with publicly. And if it happens privately, then it has to be dealt with privately. But so if it's a sort of a disagreement in terms of something that comes up at a meeting and, and I disagree with what somebody is, is saying, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a meeting where I was sure that I was right. <laughs> and and I disagree with somebody and and we talk more and I realize they are totally seeing something that I didn't see. They are looking at a problem from a perspective that I didn't even know existed. And sometimes I completely change my mind or sometimes I still believe the basic, my basic belief, but at the same time, my opinion is softened and um, it's just softened and more open um, to they've they've expanded my mind or heart. And and so, yeah, I still think what I said is true, but I see what you're saying. And I realize now that it's not so simple or something like that. So so it's it's um, like so many people said, disagreement is crucial and disagreement will happen. If it doesn't happen, there's something wrong, but it's a good thing. I look forward to getting to know board members really well so that we can be really honest, um, polite, respectful, but really honest. Um, Cause when honesty, deep level honesty happens, that's when um, things really move. Thank you. And Krista, same question. Sure. Harry, could you repeat it just one more time, please? Absolutely. Thank how, you. how will you handle disagreements with fellow board members, the superintendent, or community members? Yeah, well, first of all, we're all human, and we are far from perfect, and disagreements are important because we learn various opinions and perspectives from each other. It helps us to broaden our minds and our knowledge, which is so important. Um, also, I like to approach things, issues, 
with an inclusive mindset. That's really, really important to me. Um, allowing myself to be uncomfortable with the different views or, or just in the disagreement, all right? Um, reflecting on what I know and what I don't know, being an active listener, and really just gathering all the information I can and being willing to openly work with that person if they don't agree, if we don't agree on an issue. But the key for me is being an active listener and being open to finding a solution that works for everyone in the best way possible. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay, and that finishes up the, the first question. The second question will begin with Emily and we will end with Grant. So Emily, you get this question first. And the question is, the district is putting a lot of focus on the social and emotional needs of students. That is a very broad area. Where do you think Penfield should focus those resources? That's a good question. So I think that Penfield, um, what we've done so far is focus our efforts on making sure that every student feels included, making sure that every student, um, working on making sure that every student has a voice. Um, when we talk about social emotional um, well being, you know, this pandemic has caused um, kids to feel isolated um, and to not have that social interaction that is so important. Um, and through the different um, through the different avenues that the district is currently um, seeking, whether it be through social emotional, having a social emotional um, learning time built into the schedule to work on um, student uh, growth, to work on student interactions, to work on, how to just overcome things that are happening. Um, I think that it's key to helping kids with their, with their, um, to helping kids cope and to learn how to um, persevere through the things that, the challenges that we've even faced um, within the last few years. Um, I think that another avenue of social emotional learning or social emotional growth would be diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, making sure that all students um, are included in the curriculum or see themselves through our, in our teachers, see themselves in the curriculum and the things that we are learning and talking about is really key because then that means that every student has the opportunity to feel a connection um, within the curriculum, a connection within the school. Um, and that speaks to allowing them the opportunity to grow and um, meet those 21st learning, um, 21st century learning targets that we are trying to meet. Thank you. Um, Dana, you get this question second. Would you like me to repeat it? Yes, please. The district is putting a lot of focus on the social and emotional needs of students. That is a very broad area. Where do you think Penfield should focus those resources? So I think it's so vital that we really look at, at each and every student as unique and um, support each child where they're at in the best way that we possibly can, whether that's academics, whether that's emotional needs, mental health, um, you know, the, uh, their socialization, um, you know, areas where they um, might uh, thrive, um, just really supporting students, um, you know, where they're at and um, putting things in place to help them be successful, whether it's a resource for learning, um, if they need some additional help in the classroom, whether it is um, building things into the environment to help support them, but really just supporting kids um, in a way that um, looks at the child as, um, you know, as the entire child, not just, um, you know, kind of that cookie cutter, um, one child fits all um, type of a, 
uh, or one size fits all type of a uh, mindset, but really just looking at each and every child, what is it that they need um, in their school environment and, you know, applying funds to whatever those things are that will help support that child um, within that learning environment, within um, to make sure that they have the tools and resources necessary to uh, be as successful as they possibly can. Um, yeah, because every child is different and every child has different needs. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Nicole, you get this question next. Um, so this, this might be a pipe dream because I know there's shortages of all different kinds of professionals. But I, I think one of the things would be seeking to hire more counselors. Um, my sense is that, that, I mean, probably all teachers are overworked and, and underpaid, but that, there, but that there aren't enough counselors to meet with students um, often enough. Um, so counselors, school psychologists, just to really seek to beef up those kind of staff. Um, also, for and this might already have, be happening, but teachers to have plenty of time to to be together with counselors and school psychologists to talk about what they're seeing. Um, you know, we're seeing an uptick in fights. We're seeing an uptick in student absences, saying they need a mental health day. Where you know what what are with school psychologists and counselors present? What are teachers? What trends are teachers seeing? And then seeking the advice of those professionals, the counselors and psychologists, and, and just troubleshooting together also. Um, let's not keep moving, you know, in one way, yes, you have to keep moving forward, but let's not pretend that this, we, this trend isn't happening. Let's look at it square in the face and troubleshoot. And similarly, you know, you know we've seen those, um, those pie charts about school discipline, suspensions and stuff like that, you know, sort of like what I just said, is there an uptick in fights? What are, what are, what are the source of these suspensions? Are there more kids being um, um, held after school in detentions? What for what for what infractions? And um, and not just so not just data, but let's analyze the data. What is this data showing us? You know, what kinds of are there repeat offenders? What kinds of kids are just every week having a hard time. Um, <laughs> I just got the red light, so I'll stop mid-sentence. Um, so yeah, so so troubleshooting and more more mental health professionals. Thank you, uh, Krista. Next, Thank you. Um, so there is a lot of chat um, about social emotional learning, social emotional needs of our children. And there is no doubt that our children don't deserve it and require it. However, I see that our teachers are the bridge between the world and our children. And I would definitely like to see our children supported through our teachers. If we support our teachers with their own social emotional learning, with their own professional development and giving them all the resources and the tools that that they need to be the, be the best selves so that they can collect data, then we can aggregate the data. Like, I completely agree with Nicole with hiring more professionals when it comes to mental health um, support. And just our kids deserve this. We need to be putting worldly citizens out there into this world, not just academics. And I believe that if we have really strong, emotionally intelligent kids, students, our academics are going to fly and it's all connected. So first of all, giving our teachers a little bit more or a lot more support in all their resources and tools that they need to help support our children. And then we're going to see changes in our kids in a good way. That's it. Thank you. And Grant, you get to this question. Two minutes. Uh, yes. So um, I know that, uh, you know, being in a DEI community at uh, Harris Hill School, this uh, SEL does come up in conversation. Um, I don't know much about it. It is, it's kind of confusing. 
Um, I do know that the school is putting a, a major focus into it next year. Um, in the last board meeting, they went over some of the new curriculum. And I know SEL is something that they were talking about doing every day. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about with my kids that are at, at Harris Hill, they're doing things I think called community circles, um, where they're going in and talking about different things. Um, I think it's important, one, uh, to better understand, you know, what's involved in it, the details of it, um, you know, what's, what's going to be included. So all, all kids are different. I'm sure some kids are going to need, um, you know, more help than others. I think it's important for all kids though, obviously social emotional learning uh, and the well-being and everyone is very important. So working with counselors, um, I think communication with parents, um, and I think parents can better help if we, if we better understand what it's going to entail um, and the things that are going to be discussed in those things. Uh, just like everything, um, you know, this could be, there's a lot you, you talk about in, in social circles where, where everyone's included. Uh, some, of the, some of the more serious things obviously need, need to be handled privately. Um, so I guess uh, I can better understand and articulate uh, once I better understand what it looks like, what it looks like in the school. Um, obviously different levels are gonna be age appropriate, uh, but those are some of the things that uh, I need to understand better uh, to be able to discuss that more intelligently. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move to the next question. And Dana, you get this one first. And it is about school start times. Some districts in the county have changed schedules to allow for how teenagers' brains are wired for evening. What are your thoughts on Penfield also changing its schedule? I think first and foremost is really um, gaining um, access to community voice. Um, identifying um, what uh, the community feels in terms of something like that, because that could really impact um, schedules um, for families. And we wanna make sure that it would work for everybody um, and that we can support that. And um, just really, um, you know, whether it be surveys, whether it be uh, community conversations um, and just and, and talking with the students, I think that's really important as well. Um, you know, is there a way to feasibly incorporate options? Um, you know, or, you know, is it something that, um, you know, I, I guess just really, again, that community voice is so vital. I think it's so important to uh, learn what works for folks. Um, looking at um, how it would impact other things. I, I would want to know what the schedules look like as a whole, um, really kind of researching that, understanding um, why um, the interest is to, to uh, be looking at that. What are the studies? Um, and then also, uh, what are the things that could be impacted potentially in terms of schedule? So, and what are some uh, possible solutions around that uh, that we can support uh, students and families with? Um, so really taking all those things into consideration and a decision like that, um, I, you know, to make that decision um, in a silo, I think, um, is impossible. I think we have to really incorporate everybody into that decision making process. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you. And uh, Nicole, you get this one second. I didn't hear the question totally. Your voice glitched a little bit. I'm sorry. Let me get a little closer. Uh, some districts in the county have changed schedules to allow for how teenager brains are wired for evening. This is the community words. What are your thoughts on Penfield also changing its schedule? How teenage brains are wired for evenings? Meaning yeah, like so it's the school start time, so the later start times for teenagers um, in order to accommodate the fact that they tend to uh, need to sleep later in the morning. Mm -hmm. So as, as, as the mother of teenagers, I cannot be more passionate about sleep. <laughs> um, I think, and actually I think this ties in with the previous question, social emotional learning. I, you know, I've wondered if some of the, uh, just some of the issues that school, that kids have had post, post COVID, the social emotional issues that they've had is is partly also sleep related. Um, kids just not coping well. Um, having said that, I I as a family we tend to have a sort of early to bed, early to rise model. Um, partly because school does start so early, um, but so I would not 
personally like it if school started later, which meant sports start later, which means, means homework goes later, which means kids go to sleep later. I don't think that really solves anything. <laughs> um, my, my understanding is that, the, for, for example, the high school was pushed earlier because so many kids are involved in sports. Um, and so that so the kids can do sports and still be home at a decent time to eat dinner and do their homework. So um, I, I guess uh, I'll echo Dana a little bit in saying that I, I have my personal preferences, which is that my kids get as much sleep as possible and that they go, they go to bed earlier than any of their friends. They complain about that, but I don't care. Um, so teenagers need sleep. Um, and I personally like the current system rather than a later system. One of the things that I read, one of the art kinds of articles that I read so many times during the pandemic were families that were like, the pand pandemic was horrible, but we've never eaten together so many times in one week in years. <laughs> so, you know, just the families eating together again that happened when people were working at home and kids were at home. And I wouldn't go back to the old days for anything where everybody's gone in the evening. So it's important. Sleep is important, however, how that happens. Thank you. Uh, Krista, you get this question next. Thanks, Sherry. Um, I am a parent of two teenagers. And um, as Nicole said, sleep is important. I did, I do think change is hard and change takes time. And also, I think it would be wonderful to explore moving high schoolers to a later start date to actually, because studies have shown that they thrive better when they sleep in in the morning and they start their days a little later. Their brains are wired like that. Their, their personalities are wired like that. Um, I don't believe everyone will be on board. And also in today's world, parents work. They're in the office by eight, you know, um, or sometimes earlier. And I don't think it will work with everybody's schedule. So a couple of things working are here. I think it would be a great idea. Also, change takes time and change is hard. I would need a lot more data and feedback from the community just because to know how realistic it would be. Um, I am not opposed to it at all. Like I said, I have two teenagers of my own, and I know that they would appreciate a good sleep in before the day starts. Thank you. Thank you. Grant, you get this question next. Sherry, can you repeat the question? Yes, I can. Some districts in the county have changed schedules to allow for how teenagers' brains are wired for evening. What are your thoughts on Penfield also changing its schedule? It's the st start, late start time for high schoolers versus um, the traditional schedule that they're on. Okay. Uh, I mean, not to be insensitive, um, but I, I don't really understand. It's the first I've heard of it, right? Um, as far as them starting later, um, I think they should go to bed earlier and get up and, and grind it out and, and do what needs to be done. Um, I don't know, uh, can you can you enlighten or share any more information as to other districts, why they're doing that? And is there anything that involves that, that why that's better and working better for them? There, there is one district that is already doing it and one district that has is exploring it. Other districts are talking about it. So board members are looking at the research around um, teenagers and how they can be more effective in school with this change. Um, and that's I, I'm assuming that's why the question came up from your community members. <laughs> OK, OK, very good, very good. Um, you know, I, I won't elaborate or, or take much time on this. Um, Obviously, I'm open to anything, but, um, you know, I think that uh, teenagers, they're going to be adults very soon going off to college, and they're going to have to manage their time appropriately. Um, and regardless, they have to get up and, and do what they need to do to accomplish and succeed to what they're trying to do. Thank you. Emily, you get the last word on this question. Sure. So I believe strongly as I said in my opening statement, in doing what's best for students. 
So if that means taking a deep dive into the research to, you know, look at the pros and cons of this late start, um, that would be something that, you know, I think is important to do, you know, and then to bring back that feedback, bring back those pros and cons, you know, and have a conversation with the community. But I think it's most important to get that input from the community because it impacts so many different layers, right? So we have parents of younger kids, parents who are working. Um, so I would, um, I see the importance of, you know, just doing the research and um, looking at those districts who um, are currently using this model and seeing how, how they were able to do that. Um, how is it working in their district? Um, how is the community kind of rallied around um, that change in start time? And then bringing that also back to the community, um, getting the data and, you know, um, making a decision based on that, you know, looking definitely, this would be something that is definitely important to get that community input on. Thank you. All right, on to the next question. And Nicole, you get this first. And what I did is there were six different questions on enrichment, advanced learners, honors courses, and um, other academic enrichment programs that Penfield um, either has or is, or, or community members are looking for. So I took one of the questions from the community, but I wanted you to have that broader um, context that it was in. And it said, and the question is, what are your thoughts about the current state of academic enrichment in Penfield? Um, I, I've been, I've been pleased with it. I um, I have one son is in in middle school in accelerated classes, and the other son is in high school in an AP class. Um, I remember asking Dr. Putnam about honors classes because I had heard that they were fading out, and I remember asking him about that, and he said, "Well." Colleges don't really look at them and they just decrease the homework load and AP classes are much more important. And I just took his word for it. Um, AP is an advanced placement. So I just sort of took his word for it that um, if I'm quoting him right, uh, that that that's for kids who want to take something a little bit more advanced and that that will actually be more beneficial towards them in terms of college prep. And, and, and colleges looking at those grades. So I, I've been happy with the AP course in, in high school and happy with the accelerated courses in Bay Trail. Um, I'm happy that they exist. I, I do, I would love to find out a little bit more in terms of how kids, especially in the excel accelerated classes in middle school, how kids and, and elementary school, how kids are identified. Um, to be in those classes, I, just to make sure that kids aren't being overlooked. Um, I had a little bit of an issue with that in, in, when when one son was in Scribner Road. So I I just want to make sure that it's it's not a subjective thing that it's very um, objective to make sure that none of the kids are overlooked for those opportunities. Thank you, uh, Krista. You get this next. Mm. So this has been, um, I know this has been on a lot of parents' minds, um, apart from many other things. And I firmly believe that we have all different types of learners in our school district. And every single one of them should be allowed to find the most the best way in which they can learn. So, and I believe that the district should be responsible for that, um, helping them figure that out, helping the student, helping the parents figure that out and like meeting them where they're at and working flexibly and creatively to just create a learning style, be it through different classes, different courses that will meet their needs. Some of our kids need honors. Some of our kids need AP. Some of our kids, I know, Kids get 
RTI, um, different types of support. Um, and I believe enrichment can happen at any level. And also, I need to know a little bit more about how, just like Nicole said, and she hit the nail on the head with um, how are kids chosen for these courses and these um, enrichment opportunities? Um, who is being overlooked? Who is not being supported? Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Grant, you get this question next. You're on mute. Sorry, Sherry. Okay. Um, so as far as honors classes go, um, I think you're talking about the broad spectrum of, of honors and all different types of AP courses and everything, right? Okay. So, um, you know, the first thing about honors classes, so I did a little bit of research on this and my numbers not, might, might not be 100% accurate, um, but I think there's about 1,380 students at Penfield High School and the last uh, Penfield Prestige that came out, uh, it showed all the different various students uh, in different grades, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, that were in uh, honors courses of some, of some sort, whether it was regular honors or higher honors. Um, I was shocked to find out that out of the 1,380 students, there's 976 kids in honors classes. I mean, that's about 70% of the student population. Um, so, you know, things are a lot different now that COVID came into play here. I know a lot of colleges, I have a lot of friends, uh, kids going off to college, and they have a lot of, you know, test optional, SATs, ACTs, a lot of colleges aren't you know, aren't taking those for, for various reasons throughout the pandemic. So, you know, will taking honors classes away, is that going to uh, make our students less competitive? I, I just, I, I would think that if there truly is that 50 to 70% of our students are in honors classes, I would think there would be community involvement, discussions with parents, if, if we're gonna fade those things out. Now that said, AP classes, <clears throat> You know, those are college level courses, I guess, and, and, and you get college credit for those. Uh, some of the things I've, I've heard is that more of your state and public universities um, are more favorable with honors classes and more of your elite Ivy League schools are, are kind of more favorable about AP classes. If that is true, um, you know, maybe one to two percent of our students coming out of Penfield High School are going to be going to elite Ivy League schools. The majority of the students going coming out of the school system are gonna be going to state and public universities. So that's definitely something um, that we should look at and discuss. The addition of SUPA, the Syracuse University College Advanced Courses, College Board Advancement Placement Courses, dual college credits at RAT and MCC, those are all wonderful things. Why can't we, why do we have to take something away to add something? It, especially if it's something that is representative of so much of the student population my concern is, um, you know, why can't we keep everything? And, and on top of it, if we turn those things away too, are some of these classes that they're adding that I don't know much about, um, the SUPA, the College Board Advancement Placement courses, things like that. Um, you Grant, know, we're gonna have to stop you. You've gone um, well over, sorry. If okay. you wanna just give one closing sentence. No, that's okay, I, I appreciate it. I just, I think we need, uh, I wish there was, if this is definitely a done deal, and honors classes are going away. I, I, it's a shame. I think there should have been more community involvement with that decision. Thank you. And then um, Emily, you get um, the, this question next. Sure. So in terms of academic enrichment, um, honors courses, um, it is my understanding also that, you know, in order to have in order to make sure that we are providing the best um, academical, academic, excuse me, experience for all students, it's really important to look at the courses that we have. And in terms of the honors courses, those, um, on, those in my knowledge um, have been just courses, the same course. So if it's an English nine honors, um, it is pretty much the same course as English 9 um, with 
the addition of extra homework. And so it's my understanding that, you know, doing away with honors courses allows for um, those teachers to teach um, college level courses. So you have your dual credit courses or your AP courses. Um, and the students are able to get what they need through those courses while also obtaining college credits and being ready for college and the college experience. So college level um, studies. Um, my other concern would be also equity. Um, looking at you know, how kids are placed in those, um, those advanced courses, you know, looking at giving those kids who love learning the opportunity to take those courses. So maybe they are not able to, you know, receive A's in those courses. Maybe they're a C student, maybe, um, you know, they're just barely passing the course, but they really, really enjoy it and want to um, advance to, you know, taking another course, another AP level course, because they enjoy the curriculum, they enjoy um, learning. So I think it's really important that we're looking at those things as well, and not just looking at giving the opportunities to the A and, you know, um, the A and A plus student, but giving it to making sure that all students have that opportunity to, um, to take those courses, um, but then also making sure that we are grading for equity and making sure that the grading is equitable for all of the students as well. That's really important um, to meet the needs or to make sure that all students are um, achieving the benchmarks. And then supporting all students with RTI and providing the opportunities for students to receive that additional support that they need in school, I think is also important. Thank you. Dana, you get this question last. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So I think honors, um, just like um, meeting our kids with so many other needs is, is extremely important. Um, you know, being able to support kids. Um, if there's a child who is, um, uh, you know, that that's where they excel is um, being able to have that extra challenge. That's how they thrive. I think that's that's important and you know definitely some concern with um, you know those classes um, being phased out. Um, so you know you have kids that thrive in your arts. You have kids that thrive in your honors classes. You have kids that um, thrive in all sorts of different environments and just really being able to um, make sure that you can um, help support uh, the need for that challenge, making sure that every child has, um, you know, that area that is special uh, to them, uh, that they can uh, be successful. And, um, you know, I think a lot of kids have worked very hard too. And when something has been in place um, and then for that to change, um, you know, I know uh, someone else on here mentioned change is hard. Um, absolutely. Uh, so, but I think it's really taking a look at that, looking at, okay, so how can we support um, the, the need of that child? Um, what might that unmet need be and how can we accommodate it? So, um, you know, just how can, how can we put challenges in place to support those kids to make sure that they can um, still thrive and, um, you know, still have that confidence that, um, you know, uh, just feeling of success um, and accomplishment in their schooling um, and that every child has that opportunity, um, you know, in whatever way that is to support um, their, their skills and their abilities and the tools and resources so that they can um, all have that opportunity. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. And the next question still deals with some of the community um, um, concerns around certain things. And there's four questions related to music and art. And Krista, you get this question first. And I took several questions and sort of reworded them together. And the question is, do you support music and the arts as an important component of the K-12 education experience? And if so, how would you work to provide the necessary resources to assure access to music and arts instruction? Sorry. 
Um, yeah, this has been a really hot topic in our community um, over the last couple weeks. And I fully and completely support the arts and music. Um, I have autistic and musical children myself, and I don't know where they got it from because it's not from me or my husband. Um, but Penfield has done such a brilliant and wonderful job in providing all of these different avenues for our musical and art-minded children to explore and um, just find themselves. Also, music and art is such a huge social-emotional learning tool where, especially during the pandemic, I know my children turned to their art and their music during the pandemic to help them ease any difficulties with their emotions or you know, just how to pass the time because they're not in school. And I feel that um, I think Penfield could do more. We can add more to these programs because when we have highly intelligent social emotional learners, um, it reflects in their academics. So I would like to see more being done with the arts and the music and not less. And I would definitely, um, I'm sorry, Sherry, was the question funding? Resources, what resources would you um, work to provide to assure access to music and arts instruction? Well, first of all, I would make sure that these art, art teachers and music teachers, they have resources that they can pass on to our children. Because again, they're the bridges between the world and our kids. And first of all, I'll support the teachers and, and staff in that respect. And then our children are gonna reap the benefits. Um, more musical programs, more music teachers, more art programs, more diversity in the art, the different types of art. It's not just painting and drawing and coloring and cutting and sticking. There's so much to do with the arts and the music. Thank you so much. Thank you. Grant, you get this question next. Can you repeat that one more time? Absolutely. Um, do you support music and the arts as an important component of the K-12 education experience? And if you do, how would you work to provide the necessary resources to assure access to music and arts instruction? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so uh, music and arts, I mean, it has such a po positive domino effect on, on so many other things. So um, for a lot of students, it's, it's the one thing they look forward to the most. And maybe the only thing that gets them up out of bed in the morning to look forward to, to, to go to school in some instances. So um, I would definitely uh, provide the necessary resources uh, to, to keep things or add that actually, as far as, you know, social emotional learning. Um, I think that, you know, one thing I wouldn't do, again, from what I understand, is uh, talking to people over the past week is K through five. Um, they are removing, I believe, uh, extracurricular music uh, within uh, within the school day, and they're making it uh, less convenient for, for parents. I understand that it's going to be done before school. Um, you know, so that's going to disrupt the entire morning um, as far as them having to get up earlier to, to get on a, you know, catch a bus and go to school to do that before school. So if it is such an important thing that we're going to focus on, um, I don't think that making it less convenient for, for students to participate in something so important um, is the right way to go. Thank you. Emily, you get this question next. Sure. Um, so I do believe that the music and art program is very vital to our students. Um, Penfield has a history of a great music or a reputation of a great music and arts program. Um, I think that what is important um, is to understand that I know that it's been a hot topic of, of late. Um, and that, you know, the district has proposed um, some changes. Um, but in proposing those changes, it was just trying to be transparent with their thoughts as far as um, their next steps um, with the programs. But that's not to say that they're trying to cut the programs or trying to make it more difficult for parents. Um, what was happening first was just um, kind of getting feedback from teachers 
before another draft was sent out. And um, we saw, everyone saw in their emails today that um, there have been changes made um, based on feedback from teachers. Um, but what I would say is in order to um, boost the program, I would like to look at, you know, grant opportunities through PTA, through advocating um, at the local and state level um, in order to make sure that we are being fiscally responsible. But I do think that it is really important um, to continue um, the music and art programs at the level that it is at. Um, and so, you know, we need to work in partnership with, you know, our um, committees and with the government, the government um, uh, states and uh, state legislators to make sure that we are able to continue and to improve on the things that we are currently doing. Thank you. Uh, Dana, you get this question next. Great, thank you. Okay, so music and arts, absolutely um, very important. Um, it's such a vital, um, thing for kids. It uh, can be a great uh, coping mechanism when kids are struggling, um, maybe going through a tough time. Um, it can really be a place where their talents can come out and um, just uh, really thrive in that way. Um, in terms of being, oh, and speech, uh, language development, uh, music is actually known to be able to help support that process as well. Um, you know, when uh, singing and, um, you know, kind of exercising, getting those those uh, words out and, and uh, that language. So anyway, so in terms of how would I uh, support that in terms of funding? So um, one, I think, uh, uh, there's so much with music that can be done and, and art that we could probably look at some uh, fundraising opportunities um, as a potential way of um, doing more with that and um, ensuring there's funding. Uh, the other thing is grant opportunities, really getting out there and taking a look at what grant opportunities might be there um, to not only maintain the music and the art program that um, the district currently has, but how can we grow on it? How can we um, do more with it? Um, I'm sure there's some really uh, great innovative um, things that can be done and opportunities out there um, that we could do more with. So um, yeah, so that's how I would go about that. Thank you. Thank you. Nicole, you get this one last. Well, I think we just hit upon a topic that if we were all on the board, we'd all be in agreement. <laughs> Because, <laughs> uh, yes, I echo everything everybody said in terms of the importance of the arts. You know, I'm a uh, liberal arts college kind of person and that I think music and art are important even if you wind up becoming an engineer. Um, it's just, you know, the discipline that it teaches kids, the appreciation for beauty, um, uh, just I was talking to somebody the other day and they said people like to hire musicians because musicians know how to think they are disciplined. Uh, so, and that's, you know, that's just musicians. So I think it, I think it is, um, is absolutely vital if we're talking about quality education, which I know Penfield, we like to pride ourselves on. You can't have a quality education without music and art. Um, I think the only thing that I would the only thing that stands out to me at this moment that I would like to see more of, especially in this hopefully post COVID era is more uh, sort of field trips to artistic um, expressions, um, musical productions, art galleries, um, you know, where it's, you know, age appropriate from, you know, elementary all the way up on, you know, through high school where they could maybe in the high schoolers could go to, to an evening production, but where kids who might not be able to do something like that with their families can, can go to a museum, can go to a, a musical or a production or something at the Jiva and be exposed to that level of excellence. Thank you. So we have um, time for one more question before we get to a closing. Um, so we're going to start back at the top again with Grant. And this is a budget question um, that I did reword a bit. 
And it's the district promotes re remaining under the tax cap year after year. After, however, many community members are still concerned about budget and levy increases. How will you work with the district and the rest of your board members to contribute to ensuring fiscal responsibility? Yes, good question, good question. Seeing we all had a town-wide reassessment of our houses recently, um, it is very appropriate here. Um, okay, so, you know, some of the things, you know, and I commend the, the town, you know, we have wonderful facilities, there's great programs, so there's a lot of good things um, going on. Um, I don't wanna be, you know, negative as far as the years past, but that being said, this year, so we're two years past the pandemic, okay? Um, there's affected a great deal of people financially. Okay, obviously with the way inflation is right now, gas, groceries, housing. On top of it, the town townwide property reassessment. Okay, most houses, most people that I've spoken with, their houses have gone up forty to one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. Okay, so what I understand is this year's budget is going to be somewhere in between a four to five percent increase. Okay, so just like any multi-million dollar budget there's always always room to to cut things out real common sense prioritize as a board um we should be staying flat or in the black for sure we should not be in the red this year um, i'd also like to understand um as far as covid relief in 2021 again don't don't count me verbatim i think i'm somewhat in the in the wheelhouse here but I believe each student got about $1,800 to $2,800 per student. So about seven to $10 million in COVID relief uh, this past year. And maybe that's the past two years. It, it, it doesn't matter. Bottom line is this year, the budget um, of all years, after everything I just said, inflation, townwide property reassessment, the fact that we are going up another four to 5%, what is that gonna do to our taxes? So um, I, I beg the board and, and and the people voting on the budget this this coming may i think it's right around um obviously when the election is to please please relook at that um we all need relief and and this is not the year um to go up four to five percent increase in uh school taxes thanks thank you Allie, you get this question next Sure. So um, in terms of fiscal responsibility, um, if we look at last year, um, there was a 0% tax increase. Um, this year we are, it has been, you know, um, there will be a budget hearing um, the beginning of next month. I believe it's around the 5th. Um, and in that meeting, you will find that we, the proposed increase is under the tax cap. Um, so with last year and with this year, we are well below um, other districts. Um, there are assessments that are um, in all of the different towns. I well, I believe it's in Penfield and Parenting, Parrington this year. And mm -hmm. last year it was in Walworth, um, but the assessments, uh, that are being had um, will lower the actual um, tax cap instead of, so instead of us being at a four to 5% increase, I believe it's around, it's in between two, um, the lower 2%, I believe of increase. Um, we have had a long history of as a district being fiscally responsible. And I believe we continue with that tradition um, you know, in terms of looking at all of the monies that we are, that we have been given um, with this, through this pandemic, um, it has allowed us um, to not only have that 0% tax increase last year, but to continue and to continue having a low, um, a low increase year by year, year over year. Thank you, Dana. Same question. 
I believe that being fiscally responsible is more than just staying under the tax cap in the assigned budget. It's it's ensuring that the money that you're spending within that budget um, is done effectively um, and and wisely. Um, you know, getting the most that you can out of the resources that you have, um, so that um, you can ensure that um, you are utilizing those resources to the best um, of. of of your ability to uh, their maximum capacity um, when there are opportunities that are lesser expensive or um, uh, maybe at no cost in terms of whether it's training, um, you know, for uh, teachers or staff or um, whether it be resources um, in materials, uh, you name it, but really understanding what are the expenses um, and the costs within the school district and really taking a look at those um, and encouraging everybody within the district and, and supporting um, that mindset to really just make sure that you're uh, making the best possible use of the funding. Um, and yes, of course, staying within uh, the lines of that budget, uh, but taking taking a close look at that. And um, again, I think just it takes time. It takes hard work um, to look at, uh, you know, those details, but um, very necessary and very rewarding at the end, uh, because at the end of the day, you can accomplish more, um, you know, with less in terms of dollars uh, when you really take the time to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Nicole, same question. I, I need the question again. <laughs> oh, sorry, sure. Um, the district promotes remaining under the tax cap year after year. However, many community members are still concerned around the budget and tax levy increases. Um, how will you work with the district and your fellow board members to ensure fiscal responsibility? So I believe money should always be spent on people. And I don't believe in more money for facilities, gadgets, smart boards. I, I, but I believe that the, the teacher salary should be competitive and alluring. So, and I don't believe that taxes should be raised so that essentially, um, I, I think money should be reallocated to prioritize people. So, and and like I said, not buildings, gadgets. Um, you know, he might have gotten this wrong, but one of my sons said that you know the the the, the computers that all the kids got that they're allowed four replacements of computers. And I was like, that is ridiculous. These kids could play football with these computers and get it replaced four times. You know, that's that, I, he might've gotten that wrong. So, but um, that's the kind of thing, like, I think, I think we should obviously be in the black, uh, that being in the red shouldn't even be a consideration and that you can be in the black if you put people first, my husband is a college professor and teaches with chalk, <laughs> um, teaches physics with chalk. Um, he was amazed that uh, the kids have smart boards, <laughs> you know? So, so I just, you know, and we're a techie family and we, we love technology. It's not that it's just that I think sometimes it's sort of like universities where parents pay more and more tuition and there's these fancy buildings and faculty isn't getting great salaries. It's just fancy buildings and college presidents and other administrators getting great salaries. So um, I, yeah, spend money on people um, and because people is what our kids need, not fancy buildings and gadgets. Thank you. Krista, you get this one last. Thank you. Um, Folks, I'm not going to pretend at all to understand um, finances in the way that a school is run, um, a school district is run. I know there's lots of money involved because a lot of money is needed to run a school district well and efficiently and safely. Um, however, I do know from if you attend a board meeting and if there's a budget they, they're talking about the budget, they give you lovely pieces of paper and everything is itemized and everything is listed. And I've had to sit down after a board meeting and look at those numbers 
because it's a lot. I do believe that Penfield has been fiscally um, responsible with with our with taxpayers' monies. I do believe so. Um, however, I do believe that some of the money can be spent on different things, and I would like to work with my board members um, to figure that out. And I definitely need to learn more, and I want to learn more. Um, That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, those are the questions we're going to ask this evening. And, and we're going to go back to the top of the ballot order. And we'll begin with Grant for your two minute closing statement. Okay, let me. Uh, oh, I'm not muted this time. Good, good. Okay. <clears throat> okay, well, it's definitely been an interesting evening. Um, I write, I'd like to reiterate a few things from my opening statement. One, um, again, I have no agenda. And two, I am not endorsed by any outside groups or influences. What is this election about? This election is 100% about the kids. Over the past two years, I've consistently attended board meetings. I'm on the Harris Hill DEI committee, and I have regularly attended various school-related meetings. I've been involved in budget discussions, and I have heard a lot of criticism from the community who are worried that the direction of our district will impact our longstanding reputation of academic excellence. Diversity, equal representation, and inclusion are extremely important, as is kindness and respect. I've witnessed the ever-changing dynamic of our district, and it will keep changing. We need to have a board who is open-minded with total representation that reflects the opinions of the community as a whole. In closing, it has been an extremely challenging two years for everyone due to the pandemic. It is time to provide a motivating and uplifting message for the kids and the community. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of the anger and bitterness. I am tired of politics, right or left, being woven into the fabric of everything we do. It is time to lighten up and not take ourselves so serious. All this is an extremely serious position. We need to be role models for these children and we can do better. The way things are today, and I think we can all agree, and it has been, you talk to family and friends, the way things are today is a total buzzkill. It is time for Penfield to unite and come together. If what I'm saying this evening resonates with you, please vote for me on May 17th. If what the other candidates have to say this evening resonates with you, vote for them. It's simple. Whether it's me, Emily, Dana, Nicole, or Krista, I wish them all the best of luck and just get out and vote on May 17th. Thank you. Thank you. Emily, your closing remarks, please. Sure. Um, as a mom, educator, and board member, I'm committed to continuing the work of meeting the needs of all of our students through professional development opportunities for teachers, um, through opportunities for extended learning or extra learning for the community members, um, making sure that um, they are understanding um, they're understanding what we're really trying to put forth and what we're really trying to do for our students. So making sure that they understand that we are listening to them and we are trying to be transparent, um, that we are making sure that they understand um, that our best interest or our, our most important interest is um, the students and making sure that um, their needs are being met, whether that be through looking at um, our social emotional learning, make sure, making sure that we are looking at um, enrichment opportunities for students, making sure that we are making sure that every voice is being heard, um, making sure that we are being fiscally responsible, making sure that, you know, we are that exemplar district that other student or that other districts are looking at. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and I just ask for um, your support in, you know, um, voting for me so that I can continue the work that we have started um, of, of late and, you know, just making this the best district for our students. Thank you. Dana, your closing remarks. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you everyone for taking the time tonight out of your schedules to view this event. I'm hopeful that my leadership experience as well as my involvement in committees such as the COVID reopening advisory committee, the diversity, equity and inclusion, welcoming, affirming and infir affirming environment committee, and my few, last few years being involved with trauma-informed care committee uh, will equip me with the necessary tools uh, to be an incredible support to the Penfield School District as school board, as school board candidate. Students in our district come from diverse backgrounds of all kinds and sorts. It's vital that we don't forget that anyone from anywhere can experience trauma, poverty, mental health crisis, and various other challenges in their lives as anyone can, um, their lives and any, any Anyone can surpass those challenges with the right support combined with a willingness to work through those challenges. I also come with a wealth of knowledge on community resources with my greatest knowledge being on the area of community resources for mental health supports as well as community resources that can help better meet uh, people where they're at with their needs. Um, we hear so much about inclusivity. I would love to see our kids flourish by having opportunities for everyone to be involved. For example, if a student has a physical need that limits them from participating in the same activities as their peers in physical education class or in sports, I would love to see adaptive fitness opportunities become a part of the solution in order to provide truly inclusive opportunities to these students. This is just one of many potential opportunities uh, out there to further enhance um, experiences and successes for students within the Penfield District. The same reigns true for academics and looking at each student and supporting them uh, where they're at so that they may achieve the greatest level of success possible, building self-esteem and conquering barriers that they may have previously seen that may have previously seemed impossible. This includes students who have been involved in the honors programs and the arts programs. It's vital that we look at each child as having unique learning needs. Again, none, um, none uh, or great, are greater or lesser than one another, simply diverse and unique to each child. It's important that we offer every child the resources necessary to thrive uh, to their education that best matches their strengths and their talents. I look forward to the opportunity of potentially serving on the board and would find it an honor if you would consider placing your vote for me, Dana Mar, on May 17th. Thank you. Thank you. And Nicole, your closing remarks, please. So I taught high school English a long, long time ago in another life. And one of my favorite books <laughs> to teach was a medieval French epic poem called The Song of Roland. It was written about the 11th century and it was about one of the French King Charlemagne's battles. And Charlemagne asks Roland to, to bring up the rear guard of the army and the opposing army attacked the rear guard and killed them all. And Charlemagne found out that something was afoot and circled back around, but by the time he got there, everybody was dead. So that's pretty grim, <laughs> but there's a principle in the poem that has become a mon mantra in our home. And, it's, and the mantra is that it's better to be in the vanguard and lead than to remain in the rear guard following behind. It's better to lead. I wanna see Penfield leading in attracting and keeping the best teachers from diverse backgrounds with competitive salaries and supportive environments. I wanna see Penfield leading in DEI efforts where if you're a new minority family moving to the Rochester area, you hear the words on the streets Move to Penfield, your kids will love the schools. I want to see Penfield leading and teaching about America's incredible beauty and strength along with her tragic flaws. I want to see Penfield leading in implementing disciplinary measures that truly lead to change and restoration among kids. I want to see Penfield in the vanguard. I don't have all of the answers, but I will be a great piece of the puzzle. And I believe that together we can make Penfield into something even more beautiful. Thanks. Thank you. And Krista, your closing remarks, please. I would like to thank Sherry, Sharon, and fellow candidates and all community members who are present this evening. Penfield, like every other thriving town, as areas that need extra support and care. We are fortunate to already have these resources and they just need to be made accessible to all community members. I believe that we have the opportunity to engage and partner with each other in extraordinary and creative ways that can make our school district and our community 
not only known for academic excellence, but one that has a true sense of belonging for all who reside here. If elected to the Board of Education, I will work diligently to be part of the connection between our students' voices and our district's choices. I will speak up for all students and actively advocate for every single one and their needs. Remember that doing the right thing doesn't know a season. Thank you. Thank you. And that ends my portion of the candidate night. Thank you to all of our candidates. You did an amazing job. And I will turn this back over to Sharon Urquitz for closing. Again, I would just like to reiterate and thank all of the candidates for coming tonight and sharing their views with the community so they could get a feel for who to vote for. Our partners at PCTV, Dave and Brian, for everything they do behind the scenes to always keep us up and running. And um, also, again, to Sherry, our amazing moderator, who year after year has run a really great um, program for us. And last but not least, please remember to vote this Tuesday, May 17th from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. in our Penfield High School um, gym. Hope to see everybody there. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. Thank you.